So let's review of how we got to where we are right now. In 1789, you have the revolution in France. This makes the French very proud, a lot of nationalistic pride. It also makes the rest of Europe a little worried. They're, they're all monarchies. They don't like this idea of overthrowing your kings. And so during this revolutionary period, you have a series of wars with the rest of Europe. Revolutionary France does, essentially the French Revolutionary Wars. And during that period, Napoleon becomes quite famous as the French and maybe the best European military commander. So now Napoleon is starting to become essentially a hero in France. And by 1799, he's able to come to power in a coup d'etat with a couple of other people, and then he outmaneuvers them. And then by 1804, he becomes the Emperor Napoleon. And he's and this whole period, he is now starting to expand the empire. So these were the Revolutionary Wars. Now these, you can consider right over here, the Napoleonic Wars. And the peak of the French Empire under Napoleon happens in 1812, and the real downfall if, if you ask my opinion and many other people, it would be when he invaded Russia that really decimated the French Grand Army. And then we saw in the last video, by April of 1814, he, by the, the Sixth Coalition, was finally successful against Napoleon. And then he was, he was exiled to the island the island of Elba, which is now where we're, we're taking up the story. He only hung out there for about a little under 10 months. He started, one, he was separated from his family, so that even though he might have you know, been put in charge of this little island, it, it was not maybe what he wanted, and he obviously was a very ambitious person on top of that. He caught wind of what was going on in, in France. Louis XVIII was there. The nobility returned. They weren't treating the old army veterans well, which made him suspect that he might be able to maybe retake control somehow. Uh, on top of that, the French Empire was being shrunken back to its original boundaries, which made many people in France a lot less proud. So Napoleon started to sense that maybe he could do something. On top of that, he caught wind that people might not leave him in Elba because he is Napoleon and they, they were afraid that he might come back. So they might banish him to someplace even more remote or there might be some attempts to assassinate him. So with that in mind, being who he is, and being as creative as he is, he's able to somehow escape from Elba. He's able to get a boat, land on the southern shores of France. The French authorities are able to catch wind of this. They send the military to engage with him. So this is the French military to essentially confront, capture, kill Napoleon on the, on the southern shores of France. And when he sees them, he dismounts from the horse that he's got. He walks up to them completely unarmed and says, go ahead shoot your emperor, which was, in my mind, a fairly gutsy move to do. And they rally around him, and he's able to actually take control of the army that was sent to capture or kill him, and he starts marching to Paris. He starts marching to Paris. Louis XVIII, the brave man that he is, catches wind of this and escapes. And so you have, by March of 1815... Napoleon is able to retake control of Paris and essentially France. And this is the beginning of what is known as the Hundred Days. The, the Hundred Days. And it actually is about 111 days, but that just doesn't sound as good. So it's 111 days between March of 1815 and July of 1815. Well, you can imagine, even before Napoleon was able to reach Paris, a few days before he was able to reach Paris, word got around to the rest of Europe what's going on, that Napoleon was back. They didn't like it. They essentially announced that they would not stand by there, and they were going to start forming a new coalition to stop him. So Napoleon had two options once he gets to Paris. He could essentially, he, option one was essentially sit and wait, wait for the combined forces of Europe to kind of uh, reorganize and then attack him. Or he could, go, he could go on the offensive. He could attack before they had a chance to fully regroup. So you can imagine he viewed this as being his best shot. So he starts going after the combined forces of Great Britain and Prussia in what is now Belgium. And over there is where he engaged in probably one of the most, there were several battles, but the decisive battle was the Battle of Waterloo. Waterloo which is possibly one of the most famous battles in all of history, maybe, maybe due to also the, the ABBA song about it. And it was there that he met the Duke of Wellington on the British side and, and, and Blucher 
on the Prussian side. And at, at Waterloo, Napoleon had seven year, 80,000 troops. Uh, the other side had 120, 130,000 troops. Extremely, extremely bloody battle. 40, 50,000 people killed, injured, missing, on and on and on. But in the end, Napoleon lost. And many historians, there, there's different reasons for why he lost. He actually did a pretty good job considering the scenario. The ground, because of the weather, weather was very muddy and actually was not good for being on the offense. It was very good conditions for being on the defense. And as we know, Napoleon was essentially trying to take out the, these somewhat remnant armies before the, the, the coalition, the, the seventh coalition essentially, had a, had a chance to fully, to fully uh, get back to full force. But he loses at Waterloo. There are a few skirmishes after that, but the French retreat back to Paris. And at this point, Napoleon sees the writing on the wall. He's not completely delusional. He sees that if they were able to, especially if the Prussians are able to get him again, they might not let him live. They might really do something crazy with him. So he surrenders himself to the British, and then they exile him to the island of St. Helena, which is one of the very remote islands that he was afraid of to being exiled to to begin with. And just to give a sense of how remote it is, this right over here is the southwest coast of Africa. So this is Africa right over here. St. Helena is right out over here, almost in the middle of the Atlantic between Africa and South America. And that's where Napoleon would live out the rest of his life in a very uncomfortable situation, much worse than what he had going on in Elba, separated from everyone else. And then he dies in 1821. The official cause, and this is what many historians do believe actually happened, is that, that he died of stomach cancer. Uh, but many there are theories that it mi there might have been some type of assassination, some slow arsenic poisoning. There was a lot of arsenic uh, in, in his tissue. Uh, his body was unusually well preserved after his death. That's one of the things that arsenic does. Some people think it might have been ar inadvertent arsenic poisoning because of the environment that he was in, uh, the conditions, even it might have been um, uh, the paint in, in, in the walls. But either way, he really lived out roughly the last, the last six or set, last six years um, in, in a pretty unpleasant conditions and, and then died of stomach cancer. And that was essentially the final end of Napoleon.